having discussions and learning. Thank you. The, the program is being recorded. Um, so as an art historian and a lawyer, um, I probably share this feeling with many of you in the room, and um, I'd like to invite you to actually use the chat option to tell us where you are and uh, whether you are attorneys, um, art historians, artists, or friends of some of these uh, subgroups, but um, probably many of you have shared this experience with me when you go to a library, be it New York Public Library or Art History a Library in Paris or anywhere else. For example, I was this morning at the University uh, Library in Zurich and there's a copy of this fine volume one and volume two of the catalog Resonate. Um, and you're very grateful for those people who spent countless hours putting together fantastic research for somebody's unknown yet to be determined benefit. And um, let's think about the maybe most famous French painter. Um, you might not like him, but Renoir has been around um, for a while. His paintings have been everywhere. And if you want to find out where they've been, how many there are or how many there might be, you might check out one of the catalog resonates for Renoir, for example, one written by Francoise Dolte. Very interesting, useful, and perplexing volume, uh, one, two, three, four, five, and you know you're looking at particular volume if you count the number of stars in a particular tome, organized not necessarily chronologically, but organized by which way a figure, be it female or male, is looking, whether they're wearing a hat or not, whether they are playing with their hair or musical instruments. So the way information is organized in these awesome huge volumes, catalog resumes, are organized by their authors. Uh, for example, Pissarro catalog resume might be very useful if you're looking to buy one, or if you are looking for a looted one, for example, like this particular work that appeared in the Garlet collection. Um, you might find a Pissarro in an auction catalog, or you might find a more detailed provenance information in the Pissarro catalog resume. Um, you might have some experience with um, printed copies of catalog resumes. There is a new fashion um, of putting catalog resumes into digital format. They're quite interesting. Um, this one is dedicated to Paul Cezanne and the work that you see, La Montagne, um, at some point had a black and white photograph reproduced with provenance information ending whereabouts unknown um, until 2014 when this particular painting appeared in the Gurlitt Estate collection. So we are very fortunate today to have a scholar with us, uh, Amy Brown Price, who spent you know, a little bit of time researching um, one rather important French painter and putting together a very useful and awesome uh, two volume set. Here's volume one, Pierre Pouvy de Chauvenet, and volume two, the catalog resume of the painter. Um, we at the Center for Art Law, welcome artists, lawyers, art historians. We have questions for everybody in the industry. And one of the questions we ask because we have a clinic on estate planning for artists is who is willing to spend and how much time needs to be spent on studying artists uh, of where they've been, where their artworks ended up. Um, so I'm very, very grateful to IMA for accepting our invitation and for joining us today to tell us about the work she has done and what kind of suggestions she has for art historians looking to do catalog resumes in the future. I may welcome to the center. Thank you very much. And Can we you will... all hear me, I assume, okay. We'll just quickly share the, whoops, one Whoop. sec. Um, I can. There we are. Thank you. We're doing technological things. <laughs> or I'm not doing them because I'm not capable of doing them, so. All right, hopefully everyone will be able to see the slides now. Perfect. Okay. okay. Thank you very much, Irina, and thank you all for joining, those of you who are able to. Um, so this project started into very innocently, actually. Um, once a very long time ago, when I was a graduate student in art history and had not even heard of a catalog raisonné, um, 
I came across um, this um, odd uh, postcard, which was sepia colored. It didn't have even full color. But um, I knew I was looking around for a dissertation topic and I was thinking about doing cycladic art, but it turned out that my advisor said I'd have to know chemistry if I was going to do that. And I wasn't sure about 16th century art, which was another draw, but I was puzzled by this postcard that I'd bought that was so different from other French, the images were so different from other French 19th century paintings that I'd studied. It was by someone named Pierre Puvis de Chavan, and it was called Le Pauvre Pêcheur, The Poor Fisherman, and dated 1881. And so began my finding out more about this one, about this once internationally famous uh, artist, Puvis, as he's called familiarly. And frankly, uh, no one could be more familiar than me and calling him um, Puvis is what we're going to do. And actually, after my years of working on him, my youngest son came to call him because he was ever present, Uncle Puvi. Um, I was puzzled by this and I, so I began my considerable trek and adventure of discoveries on the Rue or even on the Boulevard Puvi de Chavannes. Uh, Puvi was born in 1824 and he painted for five decades. Um, from 1848 to 1898. And as I uh, said, he was arguably the most internationally famous artist of his time. But why he was no longer well known and uh, why what had he done to deserve that, I'll talk about that later. Uh, I did not set off on a quest to do a catalog resume. I didn't even know at the time what a catalog resume was. I wanted only to work out why the poor fisherman was so strangely different from other contemporary French paintings. Um, and, uh, it, it, and what did it mean and how had it been formulated and developed and why? I wanted only to know what other works the artists had done and what they looked like. to do the next work. Um, I need you, Atreya, because I have to get to the next slide. Here, how do I go to the next one after yeah, that? Just click. Oh, there we are. Yeah. Okay, okay. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Stick with me all. It'll be okay soon. The poor fisherman pictures, as you saw, three isolated figures in a landscape. They don't interact. The fisherman is gaunt and angular and his head is bowed, his arms are clasped close to his body and he's holding himself in a rather passive gesture. Um, he stands in a small boat and there's a girl on the nearby shore who's grabbing some flowers and she's rather jagged in outline also and fairly ungainly. And the infant is, as you see, not set back in three dimensions or per perspectively, but is awkwardly all but hovering in space. The waterway or estuary um, uh, is, goes, winds back between two spits of land and there's a high horizon that flattens everything. Um, the, there, uh, actually there's a very little shading, if any, and everyone's flattened as is the whole composition. Um, and it, it, all of this promotes a very strong sense of flat shapes. Let me go back if I can to previous and there, I see it. Whoop, back, back, back. Yeah, Which slide would you like the to second go? slide, third slide. No, the next one. There, so this is what I'm, no, let's see the next one. Okay. Everybody hang in there. I'm learning how to do this and I'm gonna do it very well soon. Um, there's the boat, the net, the oar and the shadows that they cast, which um, in the sort of flat water that you see there, but you can see there's a sense of forms and shapes in all these flat, uh, images and including the shadow of the boat with the triangles here and, and um, the net as well. Um, 
And, but there's a, also, what's unusual and that perhaps uh, made it of great interest to me, there is a sort of melancholic dis disposition, disposition to the whole. Tuvi's work presented to me with an enormous puzzle. If he was so famous and original, why was his work not better known or discussed? Why was his such work as The Poor Fisherman so different from other contemporary French paintings, such as that of the, the same year, 1881, of August Renoir, who Arena just mentioned? Uh, this is, of course, the famous Le Déjeuner des Can Canotiers, the uh, luncheon of the boating party, which is in the Phillips Collection in Washington. Um, and it's just the opposite, one could argue, of the Pivi de Chavon. First, it's filled with contemporary men and women who are having a wonderful time in the aftermath of a meal. There you still see the dining table and the wine and people are flirting with each other and they're slightly tipsy. And it's a celebration of a moment of good food and wine in, in a sunny day in the country. The full palette of, of color also in the free brush stroke, which is so associated with um, Impressionism, enhances the mood of the scene. So in many ways, these are quite different and opposite one another. At the beginning of my investigations of PV, uh, he was most mentioned for those whom he had influenced. Uh, the most innovative and distinctive work was explained by citing Puvis' influence. Seurat at the time was called un Puvis modernisant, that is to say a modern Puvis, and Van Gogh did drawings after his work and commented extensively on it in his letters, and he used ideas from it in his own work. Gauguin insisted repeatedly, once too often I would say, that Puvis really hadn't influenced him at all though demonstrably he did. And there were others, uh, Picasso most famously and repeatedly, and I'm showing you one early blue period of uh, Picasso. Uh, last year, I was a consultant to an exhibition that it was in um, Toronto and at the Phillips Collection on early blue period Picasso. And again and again, one saw how uh, he is really close looking at uh, at PV was uh, vital and crucial to the development of the works that you see here, such as the tragedy on the right, um, which uh, uh, you see the scrawny figures hugging themselves in and the, the simple seaside uh, uh, landscape as well that was very important uh, to uh, Picasso. And later on, I hope to show some later Picassos also, but only one of the many people who took ideas from uh, Puvi. So um, my quest began. Uh, I arrived in France with a Fulbright to do my research and learn what I could about Puvi and his work. There were rumors of a Puvi de Chavon family, but my advisor said if nothing showed up and nothing panned out, uh, I could switch my dissertation topic. But I hid pay dirt. Before I cut to the chase and discuss my sleuthing and research, my multi-pronged investigation into private and public collections in France and elsewhere, I want to say that it was only after I turned my dissertation in that it was suggested that it be reconfigured, amplified, and added to for a publication. And that idea that indeed I had the work, the uh, beginnings and the makings of a catalog resume. Uh, and this was importantly encouraged by my advisor, otherwise I wouldn't have even thought of such a thing. And he put me in touch with uh, an editor at Oxford University Press who wanted to um, uh, publish uh, eventually my catalog resume. In the years intervening, he went to Yale University Press and eventually I was published by Yale University Press, but it was extremely important to have encouragement in all this. And happily, I didn't know how long the whole effort would be. Um, I, in the years that followed, though, I was turning in my dissertation, I returned to France and uh, I visited private and public coll collections there and eventually elsewhere worldwide, actually. And the final result, as Irina mentioned, was two volumes, a, bio I, a biography of uh, Pierre Puvi de Chavon, The Art and the Artist, which located him in socially and intellectually and culturally and uh, with 
people in his milieu and people outside his milieu and went to how Rodin admired him and did multiple sculptures of him and so forth. And after buttressing and augmenting my extensive notes and discussions of Puvi's individual works um, and public commissions and adding a selection of uh, related drawings, cogent related drawings, I must say, I produced a second volume, a catalog raisonné of the painted work, and this appeared in 2010. Um, let me define a catalog raisonné and what was needed. A catalog raisonné, in my mind, is the be-all, end-all reference work on an artist's output. All the painted work for me, and not, although it includes many drawings, it's not meant to... Um, show all the drawings, that would have been a killer actually. Um, and everything is possible, is used in, with complete information to identify works. And I'm showing you here pages, I hope you can see about the poor fisherman from my catalog um, with the different, I'm sorry that it doesn't show up better here, um, showing up the different uh, uh, information bits and the data bits. First of all, there has to be a title and, and also a discussion of who gave the title. Uh, was it the artist himself or herself? There's then the date or the alleged date with arguments pro and con. Who gave that date anyway? Uh, was it done as stylistically? Do we know whether it was dated or not? Did the artist care whether to date his or her work? Then, of course, the dimensions. And this, too, can be fraught. Preferably, it's an unframed dimensions, uh, or then if you can't unframe the picture, you have to note that it's by sight, that is, you know, in quotes, uh, that it's within frame dimensions. Then there uh, is the work's history or provenance. Oh, I'm sorry. Then uh, other than whether it's signed or not signed and how it's signed, whether the artist changed signatures as PV did over time. Uh, so that can become confusing. Then, of course, the medium itself, oils or watercolors or whatever, the materials, all the materials used. And in the case of PV, it, sometimes it's said that he used a kind of rabbit, rabbit fluid to make his work um, less shiny. And that, too, has been examined in conjunction, for example, with the Boston Public Murals, uh, which he did and which I um, I was a consultant on, what exactly is, and I can discuss that uh, later longer if you're, what exactly is the medium? Because later on, that can also have to do with authentication. Then there's a so-called support and it, whether it's canvas and wood. And uh, oftentimes as people know that when something's done on wood, and this is not necessarily PV alone, the crack, the cracking of the wood and the patterns it makes can tell us a lot about the age of the wood and whether uh, a work is authentic or not. Uh, also, uh, as I said, is the hit work's history of provenance and the sale and exhibition history. And each of these items has its own significance. Uh, for example, at a certain time, if, an ex if a work is exhibited, who could have seen it? Um, and who could have, or, or was it hidden from view? And, and then uh, how to explain certain quirks and who could have seen it or not and copied it. Even talking about generally, did a painter paint large or small? And what were the dimensions at the given time and why? For example, uh, after the Industrial Revolution, a lot of artists had standard uh, industrial and you know dimensions to their work. Uh, rather than earlier when they decided their own dimensions and what these weren't standardized. Uh, so all of these are questions that come up. And so it's not simple data, but each bit of data can lead to not only authenticating a work, but telling about it in time and its era, in the interest of the, um, uh, the interest of the artists and the viewers. Uh, so now, uh, let me... See, I'm learning how to do this. <laughs> now, there are also a question of stamps and and uh, and wax seals put on 
uh, the stamps put on drawings and the wax seals on paintings, which may actually themselves be uh, authentic or uh, problematic. Uh, there's also the question of labels put on the verso of a work and helping to determine where the work has been and exhibited and its authenticity. As you see here, there are stamps of Pibi's initials, PPC, made after his death on his drawings. Uh, there, the one on the left is a genuine one. The other set, um, the source of which is unknown to me, and this was given to me by a collateral descendant of the artist uh, who was very interested in his, his work um, and sort of amateur art historian. Um, and But to have a seal, uh, means that these drawings were so put on the, these, um, I'm sorry, these stamps after the artist's death. So drawings that he might have given away or were sold or uh, uh, somehow distributed before his death don't have the stamp BPC. Uh, the same thing with the seals that you see below, um, some of which, at least one of which is sort of dotty, um, is again put on his paintings after his death. And again, earlier works would not have had that. I will get to the notary and the inventory made after his death uh, in due course. Um, most important in the discussion of the catalog raisonne, in my view, though perhaps not so significant in an art law context, is an analysis of the image and the imagery. The subject, how and why it came about, through a commission, which is often the case in Puvi's work for his public works, uh, or whether it's a private work or done on the artist's own initiating a uh, an image. And these can vary dramatically as I'll be showing later. And the discussion then of the meaning of the imagery, of course, is central. Otherwise, why would we be interested in an artist's work at all, I think. In short, a catalog resume is an exhaustive study of an artist's output. And frankly, to me, at some points, it was ex not only exhaustive, but exhausting. Um, I did include drawings, preparatory sketches, and studies to show the genesis of a given image and for comparative purposes and to make various points. I did not endeavor to include the literally thousands of works on paper that came to my attention and I examined as, as I've mentioned. So now cutting to the chase. So there I was in France at the beginning of my quest. And I took the rumor that some of his family existed to heart. Uh, though he didn't have any direct descendants, he had his collateral descendants, the, his brothers, his brother and sisters and their descendants. And uh, the, it's the, the descendants of his siblings. Uh, this took me actually to the Paris telephone book uh, where Puvi de Chabon was listed. And I contrived a very clever letter, if I do say so, that I wrote in, to family members that I could find. I wrote, on m'a dit que vous puissiez m'aider, which was, um, I'm told that you could help me. And it goes nicely in French because you don't have to say who the agent is. And uh, they bit. That is to say, they telephoned or contacted me and said, who told you that you could help me, that I could help? Uh, so began, so began my sleuthing and cleverly polite way of inveigling my way into the private collections of the Pivy de Chavan family. A lodestone held by them who thought it was so curious that a young American woman would be interested in what they had. And there hadn't been that kind of inquiry into Puvis de Chavon for several ge generations, if at all. And they were actually even visibly um, moved by my research. I think that in some ways I enlivened their lives. Uh, I was you know, young and I was curious and I was working hard in their chateaus and they, they really liked that. Um, uh, and I was sort of a source of amusement, I think. I also learned of Le Botin Londin, a published who's who of the French nobility, the lesser nobility, the higher nobility, and high society. It's a book with rough families and contacts um, detailed in, in the Botin Londin. Um, and I searched and visited individual whereabouts and visited all, and I show you here my scratched out notes of the sort of family trees 
And you'll notice that um, I also noted that um, that good Catholic family that the Puvi de Chavans were, they had uh, they had many, many children. And I was quite relieved when one of them became a nun or, uh, or a man became a man, a priest, because that meant that they didn't have children, they didn't have the work, and I could skip them. <laughs> uh, as you can possibly make out in this slide, you know, where a celibataire or a uh, tué uh, or uh, something of that sort. So that meant that um, it was a dead end and I could sigh some relief and not have to find all the children, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so um, Puvis work was in the private collections of what we came to call the Chateau people, both my children and my husband and I. Um, and the, what they had proved actually astonishing. Um, and their hospitality was vital to my um, doing the catalog raisonné. There were, of course, the paintings, but also portfolios of watercolors and literally thousands of sketches and drawings that emer emerged from armoire and wardrobes and dusty closets. And I assidu assiduously made notes, took measurements, made slides, and did drawings after each one. At the time, of course, um, film was used in cameras and I didn't want to spend too much money on film. So I did a lot of drawings of, of lesser works. Meanwhile, I hunted down the notaire, uh, a sort of notary cum law lawyer in France. That is to say, a, a notary has more uh, has more weight than just a notary in the United States. They're also kind of semi-lawyers. And the inventory that he had made or his descendants still had of Puvi de Chavannes' atelier and home at his death, which included works on paper, stamp, PPC I showed you, and then the, the notary would make a swirly D for his name, De La Palme, and add that. Um, at, at the death of Puvi, there were a great number of his drawings that, which were distributed to the museums that had commissioned mural works for him. And these were repositories for both comparative and uh, both comparative and miscellaneous works. That is to say, the uh, people who distribute the, the uh, drawings and uh, sketches tried to make them pertinent to the various museums where he had worked, but that didn't always work out and sometimes surprising things wound up in surprising places. Besides looking at Puvi's will and other legal papers, I researched exhibition and auction, auction catalogs, dealers archives, and, and uh, both of the uh, exhibition catalogs of the great annual salons, and, but also dealers such as Durand Ruel and Hector Brahm, and they were universally really helpful to me. And that might take me to dealers nowadays who are more secretive of their archives and more secretive of what happened to works. And it's a real headache now because um, th they're not uh, so open about letting an art historian, uh, especially an innocent and totally upright art historian come and uh, look at their archives. And it presents a problem. Um, at the beginning, it was not um, to come and, uh, let's see, to, um, and at the beginning, as I mentioned, I didn't want necessarily to record everything and see everything related to uh, the Pope Pepsher, but I really was interested in figuring out um, how it came to be. And it was so different from his earlier work or his earlier work um, and or the expansive murals for public institutions, which I'll show you shortly because they have very much to do with the evolution of Puvi's designs and, uh, and his imagery. So you have on the screen now, for example, um, on the left, a very early work by him in the 1850s, 25 years before the Pope Pescher on the right, um, and it comes really out of the more traditional realism um, he did that during, in the 1850s, his first years of uh, activity. And it's also important, so you notice that uh, it's really essentially a male model 
uh, done with careful study, done with shading, chiaroscuro. Uh, these placed in the model in in uh, it's although it's called the Fisherman. Um, he's essentially uh, only has a sort of fairly recognizable rod to say that he's a fisherman. He's put in a landscape. Um, and uh, so it goes, it's very intriguing to me that how did he PV go from the kind of styles that he used on the left? And it's also to the, what you saw on the right, uh, the whole composition and the flattening of and the whitening of the composition on the right, the blanching of the colors. Um, also notice, because it's important, that the uh, the painting on the left, the fisherman, it comes from a very important Japanese collection, uh, the Ohara collection in Kurashiki, and it goes to what I'll talk about a little bit more, which is the worldwide uh, scattering of PV's work, which uh, made it more difficult to track down and see, but it also took me to Japan, so it's not so horrible. <clears throat> um, uh, I also did suggest to you how widespread his work was. Again, I show you on the left uh, a work that was originally done, the Fantasy La Fantasy, for a wealthy woman in France. It was one of his early commissions in the 1860s. Uh, and uh, now I'm already showing you the, how he's starting to change the tonalities of his work uh, because he's already started to embark on doing large murals and to make his murals legible. He started to whiten um, his palette and also started a whole new kind of uh, icon iconography of classicism, which I'll get to, I hope, eventually. But I also want you to see in terms of how far flung the work is not only, again, the Japanese work, and they were great collectors of, of PV's work, uh, especially in the teens and 1920s um, uh, as well. Um, but also on the right, I'm showing you some postage stamps from Somalia. And uh, though there, none of his works were in Somalia, uh, it has to do as using postage stamps, which I'm very interested in, uh, and maybe some of the rest of you are too, as propaganda um, and as a propagandistic tool showing what a country stands for, what it's interested in. And um, they, these postage stamps, uh, by the way, um, it, it's interesting who suggest, who chooses the imagery for postage stamps. Um, and happily, the postage stamps was a, um, were a surprise gift to me for my dear husband. So there you are. Uh, and they're, they're quite remarkable. You see the vigilance on one side here, uh, again, used, although it's never in Somalia, uh, used in the postage stamps, and nor were any of the other images ever in Somalia. I do have to say something about Pivi's uh, large murals because um, that's what he, why he became famous. Here's the sacred wood, dear to the arts and the muses on the right and the antique vision on the left in Lyon, uh, Puvis' hometown. Um, uh, use, he used a classicizing vehicle uh, for uh, making his large, huge uh, mural commissions with which he was very successful, partly because they were classicizing and um, and uh, he flattened the images and simplified them, which is key to understanding his evolution. He's like large billboards uh, to make these simplified images that are read readily legible was important. And of course he took this uh, and also the careful stationing of various figures so that um, they're, they're red in the foreground and also bringing up the horizon line and flattening the hole. He also engineered the figures to be in place, very mindful of the architecture and uh, using the colors of the architecture and also uh, putting out figures in with uh, are evenly paced uh, so they don't break up the architecture. So there's no crescendo or decrescendo and there's what uh, I came to call a paratactic rhythm which is to say from rhetoric, like I came, I saw, I conquered. It's a regular beat uh, in his work. Uh, so in that way, it's unusual. 
Um, and one of his other now uh, large, I just want to show you another large uh, mural program that he did. He came to do murals both for the many new art museums that were springing up, just as I showed you with prosperous France in the 19th century. A city showed how prosperous it was by establishing a new art museum, just as today a new city establishes an art museum. Here is his um, murals for the uh, huge central uh, lecture hall of the Sorbonne, uh, which um, is fascinating in terms of the different academic uh, departments that are shown in the arguments among the faculty about whom should be next to whom. But you see how he spreads out um, the, the figures. And um, here is a, a, a reduced version after that mural, which is in the Chicago Art Institute. Uh, he did reduced versions, which are very popular and bought up worldwide uh, because since his once he painted uh, on canvas and then the canvas was installed in museums. Um, so to see these murals and to understand Puvis' work, uh, one has to travel widely to see the murals in various French cities. And also um, he is one group of works. He didn't visit the Boston Public Library, the new Boston Public Library, but did huge murals there. So he did murals for the mu new museums in Amiens, Lyon, Marseille, Rouen. Uh, he did murals for the city halls in Poitiers and Paris. He did the Sorbonne, he did uh, the Church of Saint Genevieve, two campaigns of murals. Uh, the Church of Saint Genevieve is now converted into the secular Pantheon in Paris, uh, where you can see his works. And although he did these works, as you see here, of the muses flying in, which is, and, and the various muses, uh, which is totally appropriate for a museum because the word itself comes from the idea that a museum is a place where the muses dwell the museum. Um, so as while he was doing this, uh, not everyone thought that, you know, classicism might be good for the patrons and the government and public um, art. But for example, uh, Toulouse-Lautrec did a parody, a large parody, which is now at Princeton, um, of the uh, the sacred wood, the, the sacred, the wood, Le Bois Sacré Chéros, the uh, sacred wood dear to the arts and the muses. I show it here in the upper left and in Toulouse-Lautrec's uh, rendering, uh, he brings in other characters from other PV paintings, but the main thing is he par he's satirizing the use of um, uh, uh, classicizing works by having a, a troop of people uh, parading into the sacred wood as if it's a theme park. And he himself shows himself as he's the small man in the foreground uh, turning to urate, urinate. So he had his digs at PV as well as not being uh, up to date. I'd like to close with um, uh, another painting by PV, his last 1897 classicizing lady here where um, you can see even the division of her face was to intrigue uh, Picasso. And here she's sitting. And of course, again, Picasso looked at her work, at, at Puvis' work, and you see the Puvis on the left here, and two of Picasso's works of the 1920s. Um, so that's all I have to say at this point, and I'm sorry if I ran over. Um, you were exactly on time, I may. Thank you so much. Um, I would like to um, invite questions. So um, for those of you who have questions, please put them in the chat. And I will start with a number of questions of my own. Um, so for art law purposes, catalog resumes have been very, very important, not just because they um, tell the story of one artist through time, but also because, um, I mean, you mentioned there are a lot of decisions that need to be made. Um, before materials that art historian gathers and transmits to publisher. For example, you mentioned dimensions or the medium. What about um, the very subject of authenticity, right? Um, how easy or difficult is it to make a decision of including something in the catalog or excluding something from a catalog? 
a very important question. And especially because people like uh, who do these things now can be sued. And actually, um, I won't get into all of that. And also because they're vested interests by various people. In my own case, and I will tell, um, in my own case, I have the securely uh, works, which I think securely are by PV in the main catalog resonate. There is a section of lost works, which may surface at one point or not. It's not clear if they were destroyed or what happened to them. Uh, then I have um, a section of clearly works that I don't think are by PV, and I clearly say so. But the most difficult one are the ones that are iffy. And in my own case, I had a section called for further study. And that's what I mean, that something may occur or, or surface that will make it seem that a work really isn't by PV or really is, and, you know, of drawings that make it secure that it was or wasn't. Now, um, in, I was called into the Robert Miller Gallery at one point, and um, and they showed me a work, and they said, you have to include this in your catalog resume. And I looked at it, and I said, well, I, I don't feel comfortable putting it in the catalog resume uh, proper. And they said, are you... <laughs> Are you willing to testify about that? And that unnerved me. But I checked with the College Art Association and I thought it over and they said, yes, the responsible thing to do is to testify. So there was a court uh, trial um, and uh, and I was very worried. The lawyer prepared me on both sides because uh, even I, who you myself is knowledgeable, could be made a total fool of by if a, if a lawyer is clever and saying, you know, how do you know this or how do you know that? Um, uh, it, it unnerved me, but happily the other lawyer was not that clever <laughs> and I didn't come out uh, so stupidly. And in fact, the side that I represented, that is to say that it wasn't authentic, uh, prevailed. But I thought not being a lawyer like you all, so many of you, I thought that it would come out as um, caveat emptor, let the buyer beware. But no, now in New York law, this is part of the universal commercial code that if someone sells uh, a painting to another person, uh, then they warrant is by uh, a given artist that, that, uh, that they are warranting it. And therefore um, the, uh, the seller has to take it back or whatever. So that was interesting to me. And um, I did want to say something else about chasing down works. People do have vested interests, like the family itself um, had to pay um, whenever, you know, the generations change, they had to pay the France uh, taxes on, on the work. And, uh, or if they don't have the money, the French government has the right to requisition works from people who can't pay for the, the, the taxes. So, uh, one of the Pivi de Chavon ladies said to me she was going to bury her work in the garden so that the government would never know that her son was inheriting and she got it and she hadn't paid ten taxes. And um, I thought, like 10% thought of me, maybe she's serious. You know, although I, I couldn't tell if she was being serious or not, that she was going to bury the work. And all I said to her was, well, be careful how you wrap it so that the moisture doesn't, doesn't get to it. So... Um, and there are other vested interests. The family itself, the Puvi de Chavon family at one point, someone uh, bought some work, asked me if I th thought it was by Puvi. I said it was an interesting work, but not in my estimation. And he sold it as coming from the Puvi de, Chav de Chavon family, not saying it's earlier provenance. So there are a lot of sticky matters that uh, I could bring up too, but that's an partial answer to your um, I'm, I'm going to quickly, so we are focusing on U.S. law, but of course you you worked with um, a French painter and a French family. Um, as I understand, a family retains in France for life the ability to authenticate works, which is not true for many other jurisdictions. Well, so if you're asking me, the, the, the whole question of experts, the experts, um, is really fraught in my mind. First of all, the, the person from the Pivot de Chavon family, three generations or four generations afterward, who's a collateral descendant, he did become interested in the family lore. 
He started a committee that he had the training or expertise one could debate. In this country, there are famous stories. I don't know, should I say? Uh, in, in one case, an artist gave one of his most beautiful paintings to his mistress. Uh, when he died, uh, his wife said, no, that isn't by my husband. Uh, but he was just getting back at the mistress. So, and, and there are other stories um, I could tell you of, well, I, should I get into the gossip? I don't know. So, so like who becomes the expert um, uh, as a family member or the designated? It is, is complicated. Um, a question of which artist merits, I mean, the question of merits is a complicated one and it's a judgment system, but um, in your opinion, do we as viewers need a catalog resume for every artist out there or um, the time decides which artists um, are honored with a catalog resume? What's the objective or goal? Do you think every artist should have one of such studies or 10% of the artists merit this or there's no formula? Well, I don't think there's a formula, but I'd hate to see people spending time on lesser, less in interesting artists. Like it seems to me, no one would would be interested in reading, or, or you know, very few people. Uh, I think it's a major, at least for me, it was a major exercise, and I'm glad in retrospect I did it. Um, I'm obsessive compulsive, and that helped. I, I view obsessive compulsive as a virtue, but there you are. Um, so I think that it would be a, a, a woefully wrong exercise for most artists to have catalogs resonate, frankly. Um, and how do we, who decides which artists merit such a study? Well, you know, now so many artists have foundations that pay for these things. And that brings other problems because the Lichtenstein catalog resume, which I'm not familiar with recently, but some time ago, they had groups and really teams of people working on his work and that they were divided up like paintings and prints and et cetera. And at the time I thought, well, if, if it's divided so in my own work, you had to really know everything in order to see which drawing lent to which lithograph, lent to which imagery, to which painting and vice versa. And if you're just doing lithographs, say, and you don't know all the paintings or all the other, you know, sculpture, you don't see the crossovers, I don't think. And there are crossovers and artists who are imaginative do work in various mediums and take what they learn from one to the other. Um, so uh, to me, it enriches uh, a work to, to have one person. Uh, I, I can understand the teams really understand doing the connoisseurship, which is central to finally, um, you know, deciding whether a work is good. And PV and other artists, of course, have their off days. And when I used to teach, I say to, to students, look, not everything's gonna be a masterpiece. Maybe um, you could learn something from your off days as well. And it's good to know that artists and writers have off days and to be patient with yourself, but maybe you learn something you use blue that day and you never used blue before and you learned all about blue or whatever. I mean, before we go and talk about digital catalogs, which is an important development, um, I wonder if you have come across references and if you have an opinion on technology being used for authentication purposes. There are a number of companies that- the What being used? Artificial intelligence oh. being used to authenticate artworks. I mean, maybe they can figure out the bad days of the artist or wrong, wrong attribution. Do, what, what is your opinion on this? I really don't know enough about artificial information and intelligence to, you know, say, say, I'm sure it could find out a number of things, but I would think that all the artificial intelligence is generated from real intelligence, that is to say human intelligence and what you put in. I do want to say something about copyists though, which I meant to say earlier. The Louvre, you know, um, and other museums, part of a young artist's education is to render, do copies after great works in many schools and many, you know. And the Louvre has a list, had a list in the 19th century and up till, I don't know when exactly, of people who would register and they would be allowed to come into the museum and do a, a copy of a work. 
And um, but you had to register the size and dimensions had to be different from the uh, original work that they were copying. Now, I also came across a copy of a work by PV that was not signed. I photographed it. And years later, it surfed with, surfaced with his signature. So that was curious because um, he was already dead. Um, so, yeah. So um, I don't know about it. I mean, you would know more about maybe the beauty of um, the beauty of artificial intelligence. There have been some studies and articles and um, it's interesting because computers generate a percentage, right? They say 90 some percent, this is by such and such artist. So again, computers are also hedging. They're, they might say this is nice, but not in my opinion. Um, Here's a question about monopolies on artists. Imagine you spent a few time, a few years working on Puvi and then you learned that somebody else was working on a catalog of Puvi. Is there, is there a cue which says, okay, this artist is reserved? Um, is there a monopoly on any kind of artist or? Not to my knowledge. Um, I think, you know, if other people want to uh, do that, um, good luck. <laughs> Viva la différence. I don't know. Um, okay. And what about... Um, of course I'd be angry. No, it's okay. It seems that some artists have been more difficult to research because their archives are not accessible. They're kept by um, auction houses or by gallerists or by families. Any suggestions on how to get access to harder to find or um, access materials? No, and, and and it is bothersome, and that especially you know in the old days, the catalogs had coded um, information like the Frick Art Reference Library had coded, and it was easy enough to break the code of, code of how much how prices were um, in and so forth. Um, nowadays, as I mentioned, different galleries with whom I've worked actually have um, sold work. And they, in one case, promised me they'd put me in touch with the buyer um, and see whether you know the buyer would say, yes, I could come and look at the work. And, and of course, I was interested in why they bought the work and whether they had similar things or whatever. But in at least two instances, they didn't come through the way they had promised. And um, it made me um, less than happy. Let's put it nicely. But there's no duty, you know, right? and, and and it's too bad because it really could help with um, further research and so forth. Um, when we were discussing this topic before, um, you mentioned digital catalog resumes, and yeah. it's that in your opinion they require more certainty or commitment from the author, or no, I I really don't know the the thing about the digital. Um, they're of course more fluid because you can add and subtract and so forth in the sense of fluidity um, that might in terms of it being a reference book and something to go to. If I bought something because in 1970, the, or nine, let's say in, in 2010, the catalog resume said, this is a good work. And in 2014, uh, they say, well, now we think it's doubtful. That, in terms of the use of a catalog resume and as a reference work, that becomes difficult um, and dotty in terms of, well, I think this this year and I think this the next year. On the other hand, when you find further information or further exhibitions or further, um, uh, you know, data on a work or a whole lot of, you might have think of a work is iffy and then you find suddenly, you know, 20, uh, drawings that led up to the work that gives it you know some sense of uh, authenticity that's important have you thought so, of converting your catalog into a digital catalog resume no would you consider it or would that um, mean revisit I, I would i would have to be convinced and it would take um, a good deal of uh, convincing why why is this a good thing i mean there are things that have come up since the publication in 2010 of my catalog resume. And I have uh, see that certain things could use correcting, not that they're wrong, but they could use filling out. And in one case, maybe something was wrong. 
but don't tell anyone, every one of you. Um, so, uh, but, you know, well, how much I'll life do I have left in me? No, you know. Um, the alternative is a second edition, right? Oh, God. Um, so I wanted to mention, um, we might go over a little bit if there are questions that you want to ask of I may please put them into the chat. Um, we will be sending um, the handouts that our team prepared. And I want to say thank you to Susanna Neal and to Athreya Matur for working on this program. Um, the handouts have a number of suggested readings as well as IMA's bio. Um, we'll also be sharing the recording and um, maybe the slides. I don't know. We'll see. Well, they're in the recording anyway. Um, I have one thing I wanted to say that was exciting. As I said, I made inventories in various chateaus and it of everything they had by PV and other things, but mostly PV. And I got a call from the French police um, years ago from a small town where there was a chateau. And they said there had been a robbery and the owner didn't know what had been taken, but that I had um, an inventory. And I and could they see the inventory? And I said, yes, I'm coming to France in a couple weeks and I'll bring it. And they said, no, no, they really wanted to come to New York. So these two <laughs> policemen from this small town, they'd never been in to New York. And they came and interviewed me about, you know, and I said, here it is. I, I could have, you know, brought it to you. And they said, no, no, they wanted to, to come here. And soon the interview was over and they said, and where should we go shopping and where should we go for tourist things? And it was so wonderful uh, that uh, I gave them the opportunity to come to New York. It, it is terrific. You also mentioned that many of your archives, not necessarily the photographs, have been deposited with the Frick Library, right? Yeah, um, is that 17 fact? feet. And they have all these slides that are from private collections. And I said, if you digitize them, I'll give them to you. And they said, they're not ready to do it. So if anyone wants to digitize my slides, um, then who knows? Yeah. Are there any artists that you have come across while researching Puvi that you think need catalog resume work done? Other artists? I'm not sure. There are extraordinarily important artists about whom a lot is known, and I don't know if uh, catalog resumes are necessary or not. On the other hand, one does dig and one finds things. Um, and I was really lucky to have the family, especially. Um, uh, but, you know, he was a victim of his own success in the sense that uh, when he was died in 1898, he really was the most famous internationally artist. And people really wanted his work. Museums from around the wor world, as I've indicated, but private collectors too. There are a lot of things in the United States that have him, you know, that came, for example, the Chicago Art Institute and so forth. Um, so, uh, oh, the other reason he's not better known, which I wanted to mention, was that 19th century art is taught in isms. At first, there was, ro you know, there's romanticism and realism and uh, impressionism and post-impressionism and uh, neo-impressionism and um, symbolism. And people have tried to squash him into a, one of those categories to be taught, uh, most, mostly uh, symbolism, which he is not and which he protested against in his time. So as he didn't fit in in any of those isms, he's basically fallen by the wayside in studies of 19th century art because that's not how... Uh, artists are categorized. So any of you artists watching, if you're too original, you won't be included in in the studies of 20, 21st century art. I'm only kidding, of course, partly anyway. Um, last question from me, unless there are a few more questions that um, are waiting to be answered, is if you knew what you were getting into, how much time you had to spend doing this, I, w I w don't think I would have embarked on it. I think lots of lawyers say the same thing. If they only knew. Really? If only so, what? If only they'd known what? Which law there is that they will never understand, they would probably run for the hills. No, I think it was good that I was in, uh, ignorant. 
Um, any suggestions that you have for our um, estate planning clinic? Because we have a lot of artists who come to us, very talented, but they say, you know, there hasn't hasn't been a study of my work done, and I don't have a a gallery representing me, and you know, maybe my family is not going to hold on to all the archives. Um, what kind of study do you think um, needs to be done for these artists to keep them um, in the Encyclopedia of Contemporary Art? Well, I really can't tell you in terms of, you know, legal matters and paying taxes. And I know my husband, Professor Monroe Price, has helped artists. He started in, in Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts in California uh, 50 years ago. Uh, but um, whereas law students helped figure this out. And they've done much more in the Netherlands Um with artists' estates, but certainly just answering in terms of artists keeping track of what they have and uh, where it goes is the beginning of a help of having their archive, doing their own archives. Um, and in terms of, uh, uh, there's so many sort of multi pronged uh, answers to what you're saying, depending, I think, on um, the situation of the artist and um, the errors and keeping things together or selling them. I'm not sure I'm really answering your question. Um, I think it might be the gallery business that should be holding on to this information or... Well, if they have a gallery. Right. Um, and what happened in the Netherlands is, but it ran for a while and, and then it, it, it sort of collapsed was that artists uh, had things, and again, Monroe would have to tell you exactly what happened. Uh, the, the government started something which was uh, a uh, an entity, an institute where people's uh, work went, and then part of it was available for display. Now, there was some kind of um, idea that Monroe started in the United States of taking artists' things and Distribu distributing them to museums, lesser museums that didn't have uh, an inventory of work to be shown. Question is who would pay for it? But the artists, of course, would be pleased to have uh, their work shown here and there and everywhere. Um, and uh, so that was one idea, uh, to have some kind of entity that would take works and distribute them for uh, exhibition. And I suppose so, then if that were true, you could have people, art historians or whatever, working on, uh, you know, inventorying and writing about them and so forth. Well, we, we would be thrilled to contribute to a, a creation of such an institution in the United States where at least some of the art and some of the archives can be deposited both for preservation purposes and for study purposes, in which case some of the... Um, current or soon to be art history students would also be able to go and pick materials that they would dedicate a significant amount of time to studying. Well, in the Netherlands, it was a kind of holding institution till, and, and I don't know whether things then would become for sale and I don't know if then money would come to the family of the artist. I, I have no idea about that, uh, but it it really is, a pity how many artists are fantastically good, but don't necessarily have the wherewithal to find in a gallery because of their personality or what have you, uh, or that the galleries are not that interested perhaps in, um, I mean, it's a whole other question. The galleries have their own profiles and things they show, and they might think a given artist doesn't fit in with, you know, pop art or whatever they're, they're famous for or, or want to be famous for. So that's a complicated you know, business finding the gallery. And, and, and I'm talking about first grade artists who, you know, in, in, in again to PV, um, he went from great fame to just, you know, no one recognizing his name. So that, the uh, you know, and that's true of art history in general is suddenly someone's discovered or rediscovered, whether it's, Artemisia Gentileschi, because she's a woman and, and she went, wasn't known and then suddenly we're interested in women artists uh, or because the work is so curious or demanding or I know an artist who does nightmarish work and no one wants to hang it on his walls, but it's fantastically good work. But, you know, people want pictures of 
thriving flowers. I don't know. Because another artist I know does flowers that are wilting as a great metaphor for what's happening in the world. And maybe people don't want to have large paintings of dying flowers. Um, we had one question from a, a student who is looking for direction and which direction if do you mentor art historians do you um set people love, on hmm? oh, I haven't I mean mentor I try to be wise <laughs> no <laughs> I've been old and gone through been through a lot I'd, I'd love to talk to young art historians and 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 I have spent a lot of time teaching and talking to students of art history and so forth. Right, you mentioned that it was your um, uh, supervisor who suggested you continue with the catalog resume work. So the question no, is- do you It's very important, I think, to get encouragement from someone whom one respects. Excellent. Because I really do think that the people who are less sure of themselves are the, are the ones who have the higher standards and they're the ones that need encouragement. The ones who are think they're so great and everything, good for them, but, um, you know. Um, thank you so much, Amy, for your time and for the presentation. Um, maybe we can continue talking about having a repository um, like the one in the Netherlands where um, art historians and lawyers and artists can um, come together and, and work on preservation and story exchange. And um, um, for those of you who are interested in relationships between artists and galleries, we have um, a program coming up on artists changing galleries or switching galleries. It's a supposedly a trend. We've seen a lot of artists um, leaving and going to other maybe greener pastures. Um, and if you have questions about um, anything else that is at the intersection of art and law, uh, we might not have all the answers, but we really love looking for experts to bring and share their wisdom. So um, take the survey that Athreya has just posted. Thank you all for coming. I think there is much more to, to say, but we can wait until the next meeting. So thank you again for being with us. I may thank you so much for your time. And Monroe, thank you for the inspiration and for the introduction. Thank you all. And thank you, Irina and Atreya. And thank you all. Thanks a lot. It was fun.